no guilt in life and no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in us. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. What a, I, I said this morning, I don't know if there's very few songs that have such great, powerful lyrics as in Christ alone. Well, if you have your Bible, then let's go to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32 is where we're going to spend the majority of our time tonight. And so we're going to, we're going to look at another one. Actually, sort of this is a combo of maybe like three uh, promises of God tonight. And this series we're in called Yes and Amen, where we're looking at the promises of of God together. That first week in the series, we looked at that verse that, that says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, that all the promises of God find their yes in him, a resounding yes. Uh, God's everything that he's ever promised us, his answer is yes in Christ. And so then we say our amen back to him uh, by believing them and trusting them and, and living like these promises are are actually, actually true. And then two weeks ago, we talked about the promise of compassion, that the first word that God uses to describe himself in his word is, I am a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. And then last week, we looked at the promise of no shame, that God himself would take away our shame, just like he did for Adam and even Eden. Eve in the Garden of Eden, when, when they were trying to cover up their shame and he made, he made clothes for them out of animal skins, he sacrificed, the first sacrifice in God's word, and ultimately how Christ went to the cross despising the shame but taking it on anyway for our sake so that we can be free. And then tonight, it's going to be a little bit different because we're looking at the story of Jacob in, in Genesis chapter 32. And so tonight, it's the promises in a limp. The promises in a limp. So the story of Jacob really revolves around Jacob uh, and the promises of God. So if you go back all the way to chapter 25, that's really when the story of, of Jacob begins. So I, there's Abraham and his wife Sarah and Isaac and his wife Rebecca, and there's some other wives there. And then you get to these two boys that Isaac and Rebecca have. They're twins named Jacob and and Esau. So I can't imagine, I can't imagine what it would be like to have one child, let alone, let alone two. I don't want to imagine it too much. I've been there when they're born. I, I'm good and glad in that moment that I am a man. So I can't even imagine what it would be like to have two children and these two in utero were arguing with each other. You, there's been some arguing going on at our house between siblings this week. Sibling rivalries can be a, a you know, kind of fun thing when you're competing in sports or something. But when it's on this level with these two guys, uh, it's, not, it's not good at all. And it started from the very, very beginning. In fact, uh, it says that they were struggling within her in her womb to the point where she goes and asks God, what in the world's going on? Why is this happening to me? And, and part of what God says there in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, is two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So these two boys, these two boys are born, and Esau is the firstborn. And as he comes out, as he's born, Jacob's got him by the heel. He's grabbing onto his ankle. He's an, he's an ankle biter. In fact, they named him Jacob, which means kind of heel grabber. But the, the connotation with that is that it, it means like deceiver or you could even say liar, which is quite a name to be given to a son, right? Hey, what do, you, what do, what do we call you? Ah, we call you liar. We call you deceiver. And this family, really all through the patriarchs, is absolutely dysfunctional. So if, if you come from a dysfunctional background, you're part of a dysfunctional family right now. Um, we've got good news for you. God can use dysfunctional families because this one definitely is. So Rebecca, 
she loves her baby boy, even though he's baby by, you know, he's got a hold of his heel, so he ain't baby by much, but she loves that baby boy, Jacob. And, and, and Isaac, he favors Esau. Esau's like this man's man, you know, he's, he's really hairy and, and he hunts and, you know, it's that kind of a thing. And so Isaac always favored Esau and Rebecca always favored Jacob and uh, that almost never goes well. And so Esau, when they get to a certain age, and we don't, it doesn't say what age this happened, but you have to guess that it's probably teenage, early 20s years, because that's when people are the most likeless, like this, let's say, when, when you know, they would do what Esau does here and later on in that chapter 25, where um, Esau comes in, he's been hunting, he's hungry, and Jacob has been in the kitchen, and he's made this bean soup. And, and Esau sells his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of bean soup. Now, I don't know about you, but there are very few things that I would pay for a, a bowl of bean soup. I mean, I've had good beans before, but, but nothing that would quite, you know, if it was like loaded baked potato soup, I, I, I might be a little tempted, but not, not with beans. So he sells his birthright to him. He says, what, what does it matter for my birthright if I die of starvation like right before? And so that's why I said like eh, it's a typical sort of thing that a, a teenager, early 20s person a lot of the time would do. And so that's, that's kind of the, the progression of the story here from the beginning all the way to the, to the end, not quite to the end, but all the way through is these two just being at it. And especially when it comes to Jacob, being this kind of shyster, used car salesman, you know, trying to trick and connive his way through the world. And then in chapter 27, this rivalry takes another turn that's much more serious. So uh, instead of just tricking Esau in a weak moment to trade in his birthright for some bean soup, this time Rebecca and Jacob purposely purposely deceive Isaac to steal the birthright from Esau. So this, this is a really, a really sad moment in this family's life. So Isaac is, is getting ready to pass away. He knows that his time on earth is short. And so he decides it's time to give a blessing to my son. And so he says, go out and hunt and prepare this meal for, you know, how I like it and bring it in. And I'm going to bless you. Rebecca overhears this. And she says to Jacob, as, as soon as Esau leaves, like, oh, this is the chance. Let's do it right now. And so um, we're going to go and, and get some goat skin and cover you so that you're hairy like your brother. And you're going to go in and trick him and get the blessing from him. So he goes in, prepares the food like Rebecca prepared it, just like Isaac likes it. And Jacob says, or Isaac says, who are you, my son? And Jacob replied to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. So Jacob is dressed in these goat skins and he feels him and he says, the voice is Jacob, but the, but the feel is Esau. He's, he's a little unsure, but he goes ahead with the blessing. And it's, I don't know what it says about Esau, that it says that the first words of Isaac's blessing, blessing was, ah, the smell of my son, when, when Jacob is covered in dead goat skin, fresh. Uh, goat skin. So you may have heard this story before, I'm sure you have, but in the pictures I've always seen of it, that the, these guys are pretty young at this point, but in actuality, they're 77. So it's not like a couple of young bucks that are going at it. These, these, are, these guys are 77 years old before this happens, which, is, which makes it way worse, honestly, to me, because um, they're old enough to have, to, to have known better. So Esau is obviously, understandably furious about this, determines in his heart, the Bible says, that once his dad passes away, I will kill my brother Jacob. 
Now, once again, Rebecca hears about this. Seems like she had ears all over the place. She hears this. She sees it. And so she says to Jacob, you got to you got to get out of Dodge. You got to get out of here or your brother's going to kill you. And so why don't you go up to my brother's house, Laban, uh, up in Haran, north of where they were at and, and stay there for a while. Marry one of his daughters and and and, um, you know, just lay low for a little while. And so that's what Jacob does. He takes off, last time he ever saw his mom, by the way, takes off for, for his uncle Laban's house. And so on the way there, he's, you know, that first day where he, he's running and the sun goes down and, and he stops at a place, puts a, a rock there, arranges stuff so he can use a rock as his pillow and, and has what, what I, I would call the Led Zeppelin dream. There's a stairway to heaven. So there is a, a stairway in this dream that's going to heaven. Angels are coming you know, back and forth, and God speaks to him in that dream. He says, I'm the God of Abraham and your father Isaac, and, and now yours as well. He says, look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. And so Jacob is amazed by this, and he names the place Bethel, Bethel, the house of God. But it's pretty clear, I think, through the story that Jacob's heart is not yet changed. In fact, this is the last time that Jacob is going to mention God's name in, the, in this text for 20 plus years, except when you see him use it to, to manipulate his father-in-law, Laban. So the Jacob came by the sneakiness naturally. Obviously, he got it from his mom, and his mom and her brother Laban both kind of had this same, this same, uh, the same issue because Laban was pretty close to being Jacob's match in this story. I mean, he manipulated and tricked uh, Jacob all over the place. Getting, there's a little bit of you know justice, um, the reaping what you sow when you see Jacob and Laban. So he he sees he meets this girl Rachel absolutely. He falls in love with her, head over heels, wants to marry her, asks Laban if he could do that. And Laban says, yeah, but you got to work for me for seven years. And so he, he works for him for seven years. The day comes, the day of the wedding comes, the wedding night comes. And the next morning he wakes up and I love the King James said, behold, it was Leah, his other older daughter who the scripture, like there's something to do with his, their eyes, it's her eyes, it's really hard to, it's hard to translate, but it could literally mean she was hard on the eyes, all right? She was, she was not as attractive as her younger sister, Rachel, the one who he was actually in love with. And so um, he goes back to Laban, obviously upset, and, and Laban says, yeah, you got to work for me another seven years so that, so that you can marry uh, Rachel. He doesn't marry her immediately, but working another seven years, and there's more years after that. And so the, every time, you know, uh, Jacob is a, you know, this herder, he's breeding sheep for, for Laban, and every time there's a, a, you know, a new generation, they change the terms of, of how much profit is supposed to go where, and so he's getting used and abused during these years in, in, in uh, the, his uncle's house. And so in chapter 31, verse 3, it says, the Lord said to him, go back to the land of your ancestors and to your family, and I will be with you. You notice the, you notice the promises of God just one by one over and over as we go through here. And so they're headed back to the promised land. Jacob obeys. In fact, this is uh, some, some commentators and, and pastors, people who study uh, this, this text, think that this is the place where Jacob actually started following God. That, that's kind of up for debate, but for sure, he hears from God to go home, and he, and he does. And this is where, if it was a movie, the ominous music starts playing because we haven't forgotten who's waiting for him back home. Esau would know when he gets back. And the last thing we heard from him is, I'm going to kill my brother the next time I see him. And so Jacob is leaving his conniving, you know, uncle slash father-in-law, heading back to his angry and impulsive brother who has a massive grudge against him, and rightfully so. And 
now, instead of just being by himself like he was on his way up there, now he's heading back south with a tremendous amount of responsibility. He's got these large herds of, of sheep and cattle with him. He's got servants and he's got wives, plural, and one would be enough. And he's got children, many children at this point. And so it's, it's been 20 plus years since he, since he left. And now he's going home. And he is scared. They're getting closer and Jacob sends some people out up ahead to announce his coming to Esau, sending out some feelers, if you know what I mean, just see, like a, a, testing the waters a little bit, like how's this going to go. And as those people come back, their news is frightening to say, in, to say the least. So chapter 32, verse 6, it says, When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau. He's coming to meet you, and he has 400 men with him. I heard a pastor this week, Charlie Dates, that said, this is not the kind of Southern family reunion, you know, in the South that you want to go to in the summertime. No, there's no reason to bring 400 people out to meet somebody unless you intend on uh, destroying them, more than likely. And so Jacob is freaked out. He, he splits his family into two. There are already kind of two anyway, but splits them into two so that if he attacks one side, the other will be spared and and... He sends the, they, they ford the, the river overnight, which is super dangerous. And then Jacob stays back and he's praying. This is actually the night before. He's praying and he says, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the very same way that God had told him who he was. The Lord who said to me, go back to your land and to your family and I will cause you to prosper. I'm unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness that you have shown me, shown your servant. Indeed, I crossed over the Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two camps. Please rescue me from my brother Esau, for I am afraid of him. Otherwise, he may come and attack me, the mothers and their children. You have said, I will cause you to prosper, and I will make your offspring like the sand of the sea, too numerous to be counted." Well, that sounds pretty good. In fact, it's the first prayer in this story that actually sounds like someone who is a follower of God. He's praying the promises of God back to him in this moment, which we've talked about. He's cashing in those checks, the promises that God has made him. And so Jacob is alone. His family split into two camps because he doesn't want both of them to be slaughtered at the same time. He's could very easily just be expecting that this is his last night on planet earth. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled and dislocated his hip. Then he said to Jacob, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. Jacob, he replied. Your name will no longer be Jacob, he said. It will be Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he answered, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob then named the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, he said, yet my life has been spared. The sun shone on him as he passed by Penuel, limping because of his hip. So this story just took a wild turn, didn't it? I mean, I don't think anybody, including Jacob, left alone by himself on this side of the river is expecting somebody to jump him in the middle of the night. And so the first question you've got to, got to ask, of course, we already got sort of the answer there at the end, but who is this man that Jacob's wrestling with? Jacob didn't know at first. It seems pretty clear. Most, most theologians believe that this is what's called a theophany. It's a, it's a pre-incarnation, so it's not Jesus, the person who was born of the Virgin Mary, but it's a pre-incarnation bodily form of God himself. Clearly, he's powerful. He, the, it says struck, but it's really, the, the language there is like a light tap, like one finger. 
and dislocates one of the strongest joints in the human body. I, I looked it up this week. The, it's a very ex- extremely painful, most of the time does massive damage to the hip. The majority of them in the United States now are because people get in car accidents while their feet are on the dashboard. Do not put your feet on the dashboard. If you don't believe me, look it up. It is not good. So this man's powerful. He's been wrestling with him all night. So if Jacob's wrestling with God, how does, it, how does God not just clearly win? Do you see that, that tension in the text there? Because it says when, when the man saw it, that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket. So he clearly has the power to just like, and, and it goes, you know, and, and pops out. I mean, to, to grow, hopefully it didn't gross you out. It, it's, it's not like this man's actually being overpowered if he has that kind of power within himself. No, this man, this God man, wants Jacob to get to this point. So every week in, in this series, we've been going when to cash in. We haven't really even talked about specific promises yet, but we're going to here in this section. So that when to check in, to cash in, meaning these are like checks made out. You write your name in, you check them in, uh, you, you deposit them uh, in God's bank. And so uh, when to cash in, the promises that are here in this story. Here's the first one. When you're alone, there's the promise of his presence. Jacob was left alone, but not. A man wrestled him with him until daybreak. Maybe, maybe like Jacob, you feel like you're all alone. I mean, yeah, Jacob had his family there, but he's the leader of that family. There was no one who was on his level when it came to responsibility, when it came to uh, all the things he had to do and the things he had to worry about, let alone the fact that he's fully prepared for his entire family to be slaughtered before his eyes the next day. That's about as alone as it gets. And yet in that moment, when he sent everybody else away and he's by himself, he is not by himself. Maybe you're like Jacob. Maybe you've been in that place before thinking like this, this may be your last night on earth or, or maybe even wishing that it was. But here's the thing. When you're, not, when you're alone, you're not alone. In fact, it's, it's in that alone time that God often does his best work on us. You need to get alone with him. Jacob did the right thing by sending everybody off and getting alone. In a busy world like ours, it's, it's easy. It's, it's easy to, even when you're alone, to not be alone. You got your earphones in, you got podcasts, you're watching YouTube, you're getting on Facebook and scrolling. I mean, it's very easy to never be alone with your thoughts and with the God who knows your thoughts. When you're, when you're alone, you're not alone. When I was asking at the beginning of the series, people in our church, what are, what are some of your favorite promises that have meant a lot to you over the years, or one in particular than a particular situation that, that really was the thing that you latched on to? One, one of the probably most popular answer was, I will never leave you or forsake you. And that's what we're talking about here. It's the promise of his presence. You notice every one of those promises that, that God had given to Jacob all along this, this treacherous, you know, sniveling, conniving path that Jacob had taken. It's, I will be with you. I will be with you. I will not leave you, Jacob. I will be with you. And the same thing is true for us. So the time to cash in the promises in this story. And you might go like, where's the promise for me? All of God's promises are yes and amen in him. And also, remember how we talked about God's actions and his, and his, and his words are no different. They're one and the same. They're, he doesn't have a special word for promises. He just says things. And when he says things, they're as good as done. So when he does things, they're as good as said. And he says, I'm never going to leave you I'm never going to forsake you. There's one that sticks closer than a brother, and I'm him. The second place is when you're wrestling. When you're wrestling, hold on to the promise of persistence. 
the promise of persistence. God promises over and over and over again in Scripture that he rewards, he listens to people who are persistent in their prayers to him and persistent in their asking him. When, you, when you're wrestling, when you're wrestling in your soul, I mean, God's probably not going to come down and, and wrestle with you like he, did with, like he did with Jacob. But boy, does God ever wrestle with us in our lives. And when you feel like you can't win, when you can't get the upper hand, when you're, when you're wrestling, hold on to God. Hold on to him. Do you see what Jacob said there? He says, the, the person says, this man says, let me go. It's almost daybreak. I think in parentheses there, the, the implication there is what he would later tell Moses, no one can see my face and live. Like, I need to get out of here. You need to let me go because you do not want to be here uh, and see my face when, when day comes. And yet, Jacob says, no, I'm not letting you go. With a, with a hip that's broken, that's out of socket, I, I've not, I, I've, I have a lot of joint issues. I, I know I've, I've talked about that on here before. My hip will like slide around a little bit like it's not supposed to sometimes. I have the only thing I've ever like seriously dislocated was my kneecap when I was 14. The most excruciating pain I've ever been in in my life by a long shot. I, I can't imagine it being here in the deepest sort of the, you know, the most muscle we have in our body and hamstrings getting a, a, a something out of joint there would be extremely painful. You remember, you know how boxers, you ever watch boxing or, you know, UFC where they're, they're going at it and eventually you get to a spot where they're just hugging each other. I think that's the spot that we're talking about here where he's holding on to him. He's past the point. This dude's 97 plus at this point, by the way, 97 year old man who's just forded a river, forded it back across. He's wet. He's tired. He's hungry. And, and then this man jumps him in the middle of the night and they're fighting all night long. In fact, the, the, if you were to translate the word wrestling there, it, it literally means like if you're translated, literally picking up dust. This was no choreograph, you know, you know, um, WWE sort of, you know, Hulk Hogan or one of those guys. Like, this is legit fighting with a 97-year-old man against God himself. And he gets to the point where all he can do is hold on. And that is the point that God has been wanting Jacob to get to this whole time. All Jacob's life. He's been fighting and cheating and manipulating and scheming to get the blessing of God that God had wanted to give him all along. But he had to get him to the place where all he could do was hold on. And while it's a painful reality, it's also a beautiful reality. God will get us to the same place. God will get us to the same place where all we can do is hang on because he loves us and he wants us to hold on to him and say, no, I'm not letting you go. I am not letting go until you bless me. You have something that I don't have that I need and I need to get it from you. I need you. I'm going to hold on and I'm not letting go. Jesus tells a story about persistence in prayer um, where the, it's the parable of the widow who's looking for justice from this wicked, wicked judge. And when, when uh, she doesn't get it because he's wicked, uh, she just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back and, you know, camping outside his door. And when he comes out in the morning and when he comes out of the store and when he goes to home to eat supper, and there she is just nagging him, pestering him to the point where he can't stand it anymore. And he gives her what he needs. Here's what he says. He says to himself, Luke 18, even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. And Jesus uses that story to say, pray like that. Isn't that wild? Now, obviously, the point is not to compare our Heavenly Father with this wicked judge. It's to contrast 
the heavenly father with this wicked judge. If this wicked judge will give, will give this woman justice just because she keeps pestering him, how much more will a father who loves us, who has all these promises for us, how much more will he not answer our persistent prayer? Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. The door will be opened to you. J.D. Greer said that our, our belief in the goodness of God is measured by how long we will persist in prayer when the answer doesn't come. That's the measurement of how much we really believe in the goodness of God, that when it doesn't come for a week, for a month, for a year, for a decade, for a lifetime maybe, keep on praying, keep on persisting, keep on believing that God is good, and he'll either give you what you're asking for or give you what you would ask for if you knew everything that he knows. So when you're wrestling, remember the promise of persistence. Also in that is to be honest with God. You see him being honest, maybe for the first time with God here in this. How do you wrestle with someone all night and not even know their name? Was this heavenly man, you know, just out looking for a random fight when, when he comes across Jacob and is like, you know, mama's boy, you'll do, let's go. He's 97 years old, but so they beat each other up all night, and he's like, who are you anyway? No, obviously not. If this guy's got enough power to just like, and, and knock his, you know, destroy his hip, then, then he knows his name. What he wants is for Jacob to admit what his name is. Say your name. And Jacob comes to this point where he can say, my name's Jacob, liar, deceiver. And in a, in a culture where names meant so much about who you are, in the Bible where names mean so much about who you are, that's not just a, yeah, my name's Luke. No, this is a confession. Just remember the, the last time he was asked that question? You ever get a little deja vu here in this story? The last time we heard that question, it was coming from his father, Isaac. Who are you, my son? And his answer was what? I'm Esau, your firstborn. Now again, here's Jacob, desperately, still just desperate at 97 plus years old to get the blessing that he never had from his dad. Because he never got it for real. It was deception. And God asks him the very same question that Jacob asked him. What's your name? Can you imagine this 97-year-old man emotionally distraught, expecting to die and all his family, fighting all night, hip out of joint, hugging, holding on because he can't do anything else at this point. I just have to imagine it would have been I'm Jacob. He knows who he's fighting now. And he says, I'm Jacob. I'm Jacob. I'm, I'm the liar. I'm the deceiver. The name that I hated, it fits me to a T. He was honest with God. And God rewarded his persistence in holding on to him. He didn't just knock him off and say, Stop bothering me. I told you I have to leave. No, he said, okay, now you're at the point of just holding on to me. Now is the time. When you can be honest with me, now is the time when you're ready to receive the blessing from me. When you're wrestling, remember the promise of persistence to keep on coming, to not let go, to not give up, because God rewards those who are persistent in their asking, who hold on to him. And the third, final point for tonight, is when you're limping. When you're limping, remember the promise of persistence. Same, same word, a little different 
meaning this time. God rewards the persistent prayers of his people. That's what we meant last time. This time it's, it's God's persistence in pursuing us. See, that limp that Jacob never got over, I mean, it didn't even tell us how he got his hip back in joint. Maybe he didn't for all we know. Jacob never walked the same again. Jacob also didn't have the same name again. Now he was named Israel. Rather than being the liar, he was the one who was victorious. On mornings like this here in Southern Illinois, when, is, when, is rain, when, when it's raining and the weather's changing, is that arthritis and that hip would start kicking up. And it would hurt, and it would be a reminder that he had, he had wrestled with God. And for each of us, it's a reminder. Each of us has these limps, these wounded, scarred, sore places in our lives. And when we walk with a gait that's a little bit different than everybody, everybody else's, God had to wrestle me and you <coughs> excuse me, into submission. He doesn't comfort us into a transformed life. He wrestles us into a transformed life. When, when God touched Jacob's hip, blew it out of joint in a split second, Derek Kidner, the writer, said it was like defeat and victory all wrapped up into one little tap. It was Jacob's defeat because he couldn't fight anymore. And it was Jacob's victory because God was actually giving him the blessing that he had actually wanted his whole, his whole life. When you're limping, remember, remember the promise of persistence. Remember what that limp means for you. Because what it means is that God has come after me and he loved me enough to wrestle with me. He didn't leave me to just live the rest of my life the way I was. He didn't leave me to just be a sn sniveling, you know, mama's boy trickster that's always trying to manipulate his way into blessing that's what Jacob's life was like and God intervened into that and wrestled him into submission so that then he could declare him the victor at, at any point Jacob could have been the victim here he could have been the loser and yet he clearly is defeated by by this hip thing and yet God says you're the one who's fought against uh, fought against God and against man and, and his one. How is that? Because God wanted him to get to that place. Because God wanted him to get to the place of just holding on. Because that's actually the place of winning. Listen, if you're walking with a limp, the limp from childhood stuff, like maybe a dad who never gave you his blessing, as bad as you want it, I mean, I could, you can name all kinds of limps that people have. Some of them are very visible, drug issues, divorce, children who are not following God, not living, right? People who have, have died unexpectedly. There's all kinds of things that will leave us with a limp. And in particular, when you're talking about wrestling with God, there's things that can leave us with a limp. In fact, it almost always does. But that limp, that scar that you have <coughs> is evidence that you've been with him. With the fact that you're still walking means that God is still at work. The fact that you're still walking with him it's, it's a reminder when I say the promise of persistence. That, that hip that's sore, that part of you that's still, like your gait's a little bit different in the walk of the Christian life because of it. It's a reminder to you that God's pursuing you. That Yeah, that was painful, but God's doing a work in the middle of it. You had to hold on until you could get the blessing. That's not a handicap. 
every time somebody, you know, Jacob meets somebody, and Israel meets somebody new. It's like, oh, what, what happened to you? What, why, are you why are you limping like that? Let me tell you. I met the God of the universe. And it, it was all I could do. I just had to hold on. The Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones was a pastor writer in England, and in his section on this, he put it this way: "So many. This is why so many of God's people limp as they dance for joy. We limp as we dance for joy." So remember the promise of persistence that God promises over and over that when you, if you hold on to him and say, I'm not letting you go, I'm going to keep coming, I'm going to keep knocking, I'm going to keep asking until you answer. He likes that. He wants to be pestered by us. So pester away. When you're alone, you're not alone. He'll never leave you. I will be with you has to be one of the most repeated promises in Scripture. And remember the promise of persistence, not just in our prayer, but God's persistence in pursuing us. Jacob running away because he screwed up and he's scared. I will be with you. Jacob frustrated about the life that he has with his uncle and scared to go home. And God says, I will be with you. Jacob praying for, praying for rescue from his brother. And God says, oh yeah, I'm going to rescue you from you. I'm going to rescue you in the way that you need the most. I'm going to get you to the point where all you can do is hold on to me and that will be enough. One more verse here. Chapter 33, verse 10. They, they come and they meet Esau after this. And Esau's not mad. Ran to meet him, hugged him, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And it says, and then they wept. And Jacob's trying to give him stuff. And he says, no, brother, I'm, I'm good. Keep what's yours. And Jacob says this, no, please, if I found favor with you, take this gift from me. For indeed, I have seen your face, and it is like seeing God's face since you have accepted me. Isn't that interesting? That when Jacob saw an accepting face, it looked like God's face to him. Because he had seen God's face accept him. The acceptance he had been dying for, trying his best to cheat his way into his entire life. Now he's found it. And now he sees it in his brother too. Listen. Hold on to him. Because when you do, when you get to that point, when you wrestle and wrestle and wrestle and don't give up and grab a hold of him with all of the spiritual strength that you have and say, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Then you'll see a face of acceptance and love looking back at you.